I'm Andrea George, Director of Town Centre Regeneration at Bruntwood. And I also have the privilege of sitting on the British Property Federation Retail Board. I'm delighted to be chairing today's webinar on private investment for public good, where we'll be taking a deep dive into the future of town centre retail. And I'd like to welcome you all for joining us today. The BPS Retail Board have been thinking about the future of retail and its role in town centres and how what they do to invest in retail places of the future can be enhanced. And I'm happy to hand over to Dominic, uh, Dominic Curran of the BPS to tell you a little bit more about it. Over to you, Dominic, please. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrea. I will just uh, share my screen. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, this webinar is uh, really a, an opportunity for us to talk about the report that uh, we've published, Private Investment for Public Good, uh, and uh, to, as Andrea said, take a sort of deep dive into the future of town centre and, and high street retail. Uh, I'm Dominic Curran of the BPF. I'm the Assistant Director for Commercial and Retail Policy here. Um, just a little bit about uh, the BPF for those who don't know. Um, we are the voice of the real estate industry in the UK. Uh, we have over 400 members, um, around 200 members uh, involved in the sort of property asset management and ownership um, sort of world. And then the other half, more or less, of our membership um, reflecting the sort of broader ecosystem of advisors, lawyers, uh, financiers, and so on. Uh, the real estate industry is a hugely important industry, if perhaps sometimes underappreciated by government, with one in 12 jobs supported uh, in the UK by the real estate industry and uh, over £72 billion worth of capital investment um, in last year alone in the sector. So just moving on uh, to the report in detail, um, we actually launched it in May at UK Reef, and uh, we wanted to make sure that we sort of uh, broadened the uh, scope uh, and the publicity around this report. Um, and it's the first of what we hope will be uh, three or four reports uh, by the retail board looking at various aspects of retail uh, and how property uh, owners and investors can support um, the retail sector over the coming years. The report is really aimed at policymakers and others uh, to help them better understand what property owners do and how we can support public policy priorities and objectives. So it's really uh, essentially setting out our stool um, uh, in terms of uh, what we can do to support um, uh, investment and economic growth. And it's probably worth saying, uh, without uh, any uh, without any desire to undermine um, the government, um, that it is a response to what many in the industry consider to be um, well-intentioned, but often insufficient policy responses to often very challenged retail places. So uh, hopefully our recommendations will be useful and um, achievable. So it's worth saying that this report is, is focused on town centres um, and high streets. Uh, we're very conscious that retail parks are faring relatively better, uh, and certainly so in terms of vacancy and, um, and occupancy. Um, town centres have always played a historic role at the centre of a community. Uh, this is Nottingham City Centre in 1748 and then again last year. Um, you know, over time, city centres, town centres uh, have changed from their historic focus of being the centre of all sorts of community uses, the expression of that community, if you like, to being much more retail dominant, uh, particularly in the sort of second half of the 20th century. Although in this century, we're seeing a change, almost a return to the more traditional role of town and city centres with a greater mix of uses, certainly more housing um, and a reduction in the importance of the role of retail. I think it's fair to say that retail is being supplemented by other uses rather than supplanted. So we still certainly see in a lot of locations, but by no means all, a continuing uh, dominant, uh, albeit less dominant role for retail in many locations. Um, so retail is uh, dominant. But it is challenged, um, or at least city centre retail is challenged. Uh, the the much uh, talked about rise of online, or what in other um, areas they call the retail transformation. Um, places have to compete much more than they they used to uh, with something that's different to other places. Historically, 
town and city centres might compete for retail pounds, as it were. Uh, now they're competing with the phones in our pockets and the ability to order almost anything, almost anywhere. Um, as such, place is far more important and investment in place is a key part of that. And we've seen the growth of online sales from low single figures in 2008 when smartphones, the, the iPhone first came out, um, to a high of 37% of all retail sales in the pandemic. Um, for obvious reasons, that was uh, an unusual peak, um, but we've seen a reduction from that high to 26% of all retail sales being online, still a significant proportion and actually back on the sort of trend growth line. Um, that said, uh, I think it's fair to say that we're probably going to see a plateauing over the coming years, uh, almost a natural ceiling. And I think an increasing appreciation from uh, retailers and others that actually what we're going to see is not necessarily bricks versus clicks, but a more omni-channel approach where the store supports the online presence and vice versa. And it's worth noting that we're actually see, you know, we, we fairly consistently see that where a physical store opens, uh, online sales in that area increase for that, that brand, that retailer. And we're also seeing peer play retailers opening physical stores. Uh, either on a permanent basis or actually to showcase their brands and enable people to uh, their, their potential customers to come in and sort of engage with the brand in a more meaningful way. And, and Tom from Souk may uh, may want to talk about that a little bit later on. So we're seeing the nature of retail places changing. There's a greater mix, more focus on food and beverage, on leisure. Uh, and also changing in terms of the different days of the week and how it's used. So with an increasing and what appears to be fairly steady state of working from home uh, levels being quite high on Mondays and Fridays, we're seeing a slightly different use of town and city centres in, uh, in, in certain locations on those days. Um, certainly more leisure uses, more people coming out later on and perhaps a bit less activity in the mornings and afternoons in some of those places. So how we manage that all has to be dealt with with a great deal of thought and care and also investment. And we think that a lot more investment could be achieved in a lot more places with the right backing, with the right policy environment. <laughs> Excuse me. That said, you know, there is a very challenging background against all of this. Um, over the last decade, rents are down by 40 percent. Capital values down by 50 percent. Um, we're seeing tertiary locations especially challenged, and I appreciate that that can be a slightly techie phrase uh, uh, to some, but you know, the uh, more marginal places, smaller towns, shopping parades, um, they've really lost out, and we're seeing much higher levels of vacancy there. As I said at the beginning, vacancy rates uh, in retail parks are relatively low, uh, but they are uh, much higher in shopping centers and high streets. So although vacancy rates have been falling over the past year or so from, from a high, uh, we'll st we're still seeing shopping centers uh, with almost 18% vacancies and uh, high streets almost at 14%. And it's worth noting that that's a UK wide figure. Those figures are much higher in the Northeast and rather lower in London and the Southeast. We've also seen, and it's really worth noting, 83% of all of the UK's department stores in 2016 are having closed. Um, BHS, Debenhams, House of Fraser, um, even John Lewis uh, department stores uh, in some locations, um, a huge reduction. And actually, in many cases, real challenges in how to bring them back into a meaningful use. Some have been completely knocked down. Some have been repurposed into hotels. Uh, others are sort of seeing the, the large and perhaps slightly difficult uh, floor plates and footprints being used for sort of food halls or leisure activities. But um, there's a real issue in how we uh, tackle that sort of long tail of redevelopment, particularly given um, EPC requirements. Um, but it is important to note that there is a divergence in retail locations. Some locations are what you might call blessed, uh, but tools are needed to help others. Um, we're seeing in city centres and certain sort of uh, prestige uh, retail locations, um, very high levels of vacancy, continuing levels of activity and a very healthy uh, sort of mixed use, but retail led market. And it is worth noting that back in 2019, the Centre for Cities released a report that looked at 
uh, I think it was the top 100 um, uh, town and city centres outside the London and the core cities. And they found something that was sort of obvious, but it's always worth reminding ourselves of, um, that the locations with the lowest levels of shop vacancy also had the highest level of disposable income in the local catchment areas and relatively lower unemployment levels. So there's a sort of obvious link, which we sometimes forget in the weeds of uh, policy, that um, the more money people have, the more likely they are to spend it. So there are broader issues at play in terms of regenerating town centres than just how good the town centre is. You need to bring up the whole community. But that said, there are some specific factors that do hinder investment in town centres that do hold back retail and other businesses in those areas. One of those is business rates, um, a, 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 a long-standing complaint certainly of the retail sector as well as some others um, we did have the fundamental review a couple of years ago there were some positive changes that came out of it. Um, it they didn't fully address a lot of the concerns that uh, many locations had there was a particular issue about the operation of transitional relief uh, which essentially subsidized the increase in rates for areas that had done relatively better um, by requiring higher levels of business rates to be paid by uh, areas that had done relatively worse. So there's in effect a subsidy from less well-performing areas to better performing areas. There was some positive news last year when the Chancellor said that that would be centrally funded rather than funded by other ratepayers. Um, but we're still seeing issues around the overall level of growth, uh, the overall level of rates, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, uh, as well as uh, issues like empty rates relief. So um, it's an ongoing issue despite the fundamental review. In addition, we had uh, 10 years or more of local government cuts and austerity, and we've just seen the impact that's had on Birmingham in the last couple of days. And that's had a real impact on local uh, authorities' ability to invest in areas and to do some of the more uh, um, forward planning and less statutorily required services um, that usually involve town centre regeneration. We do in many locations, over 300 of them have business improvement districts. They are helpful, but they're not a sufficient tool to uh, generate the sort of confidence and investment uh, that's needed at the scale that's needed. So um, they certainly need to be uh, sort of enhanced and built on. So retail property owners are in this context, it's a very difficult historic uh, context, doing uh, as much as they can. Uh, they support attendance as much as possible during the pandemic with significant um, uh, rent relief, uh, either cuts in rent or rent holidays during periods of closure. Um, and that's in the context of very little direct government support to property owners. Lease lengths are shortening. Uh, that is definitely a benefit for property occupiers. They get greater flexibility. But the flip side of that is that there is less uh, certain capacity for future investment by property owners. There are also changes in lease terms, whether that's uh, more frequent rent reviews uh, or, or even moves to turnover leases. But that does make it hard, again, for property owners to ensure sort of more certain valuations and generate capital investment. At the same time, property owners are undertaking uh, fit outs on behalf of tenants in a much more competitive market than there's been for a long time. And uh, of course, undertaking uh, investments to bring properties up to the relevant EPC rating. Uh, Savills estimated that there was something like 83% of today's retail properties that were not going to be um, EPC B by 2030, which suggests a huge amount of investment remains uh, to be uh, undertaken. And there are questions over how realistic it is uh, for all of that to actually happen. In a world of all of those costs, however, property owners are simultaneously investing in, in places. Um, they are curating the offer, um, putting in uh, a whole range of events, public services, bringing in more uh, uh, operators such as the NHS into shopping centres and town centres. Uh, and creating spaces for communities to use. And the background to this slide is, is Blackpool. And I just want to highlight one of the case studies in our report, which is the Landy's management of the Hounds Hill Shopping Centre in Blackpool. Um, they took it over last year. Um, they've leased over 95,000 square foot to Fraser's Group for uh, several of their brands. They're looking at rationalizing the existing portfolio and, and making sure that the right mix, particularly of food and uh, beverage uh, uses is, is in place. 
Um, and they're investing in the public realm and looking at how the shopping centre can connect in a more meaningful and coherent way to um, the wider town centre, city centre in Blackpool. So uh, property owners definitely look beyond the red line of their units and their properties and really try and make a place that people want to visit, want to stay and want to be proud of. That all said, government does need to play its part. And in fairness, government has been looking at the issue of high streets for a long time. Um, these names will be familiar to those who have been involved. Uh, Portus 2011, Timpson 2018, two Grimsey reviews, various select committee reports, and the Build Back Better High Streets uh, strategy from a couple of years ago, uh, which was a rather more a collation of existing and intended uh, policy interventions. So I think government does appreciate that high streets are challenged, uh, not universally, but in many places. Uh, and there has been a lot of attention given to the issue. Um, there's been a lot of money thrown at uh, the issue as well. We've had the Town Centre Fund, the Leveling Up Fund, Future High Streets Fund, not all of which have been necessarily focused on town centres or high streets, uh, but all of which have had a, a role to play in uh, bringing money into those places. The problem with those sorts of funds is that they've been ad hoc. Um, they are competitive bidding funds, so local authorities have to bid for funds. That is time consuming and eats up a lot of uh, resource. And they are sometimes working at slightly cross purposes. And so it does benefit the local authority that has a whole series of projects ready to be funded. Uh, and often they will, as it were, open the drawer and pull out the bidding fund, the, the, the bidding document for that fund um, and apply on that basis. It's not necessarily a long term and strategic approach to town centre regeneration. And I think that's what needs to change. And so we say that government actions have to gel. They have to be joined up. They have to empower communities. They have to be localized and they have to be long term. And that's where I think some of the uh, gaps in policy delivery have been in recent years. So that's led us on to our recommendations. And um, it's probably worth saying that we have kept our recommendations very deliberately realistic and achievable. Um, we're very conscious that uh, it's very easy to say, dear government, you should spend £10 billion gap funding regeneration, um, however desirable that might be. It's not realistic, particularly in the current climate. Um, and so we've wanted to um, uh, say things that we think government could, could, firstly, could do, secondly, could be interested in doing. And thirdly, we actually think we'd have a, a sort of realistic and tangible benefit. So we've kept our recommendations to just four, as I say, uh, we think realistic and implementable recommendations. That's not to say this is the sum total of our ambitions, and it's certainly not to say that this is the sum total of our thinking, um, but I think this is a good sort of first start. And as I said at the beginning, we're looking at producing a number of reports uh, over the coming year, which will have other recommendations on other areas. So the first recommendation is um, for government to implement high street accelerators. Uh, we're very pleased to see them announce them in uh, the uh, March Anti-Social Behaviour Action Plan. They build on something we've been advocating for a while, the town centre investment zones model, which uh, is a little bit sort of, as you might imagine from the name, uh, it's a way of zoning uh, or deciding a town centre or high street location and focusing investment Importantly, it really is at its core about aligning all the different stakeholders, particularly property owners, around a common vision and around a deliverable master plan. In the ideal world, it would be backed up with some fiscal and planning flexibilities, but we appreciate that that requires legislation and indeed money, and those are two things that are tricky to get. Um, but they are really meant to fill a, a gap, I suppose, in local authority capacity to generate a sense of confidence and a sense of um, vision around a town centre and the future of a town centre. And crucially, it's that future and it's that confidence that would then in turn generate private sector willingness and ability to commit. And part of the problem with the funds that I mentioned earlier is that they are short term and very discrete and limited funds. And so something that was actually about long term investment and generating long term investment, I think would be 
really profoundly helpful. And so we're very pleased to see high street accelerators announced and we're working with officials uh, to roll that out. And hopefully we'll hear more about that in the coming months. The second recommendation is to uh, create a high street task force uh, 2.0. Um, one of the, uh, I suppose, more longer term and positive aspects to come out of the many reviews that I mentioned was the recommendation of a high street task force. Uh, it has been set up and uh, I think it was set up in 2019 with a five year remit. So it's coming to the end of its course. Um, but we think it's uh, been incredibly useful in supporting local authorities with data analysis, signposting and support in understanding how to regenerate. Uh, town centres uh, across England. Uh, of course, the, the contract is due to expire. We think that there is a role for a, uh, a similar model to be in place for the long term, perhaps not with exactly the same uh, remit as the current incarnation, but certainly a long lasting or indeed permanent resource uh, for local authorities to draw on to help them uh, in regenerating town centres, I think is a um, is a necessary step and actually in terms of government funding doesn't have to cost very much money at all so we hope that they will listen um, and engage with that idea thirdly um, we need to continue business rates reform um, the fundamental review did have as i said some positive outcomes um, and more positive recent outcomes in terms of transitional relief but we still have a rate despite being frozen of uh, over 51 pence in the pound um, revaluation did reduce retail uh, values, evaluations, rateable valuations by an average of 10%, 30% in some locations. That was good, but we are still seeing potentially a five-year gap between the antecedent valuation date when values are taken and um, the end of a ratings list. Um, that's still too long. We do need to see more frequent revaluations. I understand government is um you know is open to that idea but that's subject to the ability of the valuation office to deliver valuations in a more timely manner so i do appreciate government uh sort of signposting of intent there but we do need to have more frequent revaluations and also we need to have a reform of empty rates relief um the current three-month period is far too short and doesn't take account of the length of time that it actually takes to relet empty properties and finally, and I'm pleased to say that government are um, uh, doing this. And in fact, we actually had to slightly rewrite our report because um, they they announced this uh, uh, when uh, we had a draft version that said they must press ahead with it. So in a sense, government did something before we called for them to do it, which was fantastic. Um, but nonetheless, we do want them to press ahead with reform of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954. This was, for those uh, those of us with long memories, actually first announced in the midst of the pandemic in December 2020, re-announced a number of times, then finally re-announced again in March. We do expect a consultation to be out in December, and we're already looking at how uh, we can make recommendations that would help make a, a smooth, help create a smoother, more competitive, better functioning uh, leasing market. And actually, the outcome really there is a less fractious landlord and tenant relationship. So those are our recommendations. Um, as I say, uh, I, I, I think they're achievable. Certainly, they're in train in many ways. Um, I hope that they will uh, help set us up for a, uh, a good panel discussion. And um, with that, I will say thank you and hand over back to Andrea. Thanks so much, Dominic. So much, Dominic. Um, I'm sure that's given food for thought for uh, for us all and a gentle reminder for you to start popping your questions into the question function now. Um, I think it's important to note the willingness of retail property owners to support tenants. It was particularly seen throughout the pandemic um, to invest in places and to commit you know, where they feel really confident that local government has the ability to drive through a vision for a place that works for the retail offer. But despite uh, this, uh, it, it really does depend on not just local capacity, but often also funding. Um, and especially in a world where finance is a lot more expensive than in recent years. We know that central government doesn't have the budget to invest in town centres given other priorities uh, like the NHS and schools. 
So with those constraints in mind, I'd like to ask the panelists to firstly introduce themselves and then also to tell us how they see the future of retail places. And if I can start, please, with Stephen. Thanks, Andrea. Morning all. Yeah, so um, I'm Stephen Miles. I'm a partner with um, Cushman and Wakefield. My particular area of um, specialism is in providing property advice um, on large scale regeneration projects in a mixed use context. Um, I mean, I think from a from, from in terms of the question, you know, how does the future um, of town centres and specifically retail look? I mean, I, I, I think there are three trends which we see emerging, which I anticipate continuing to sort of reshape the future. I think the first of those is um, the kind of the growth in consumers' desire for experience, um, you know, activities supported by the Instagram culture of wanting to be out and about and being seen and being experiencing things. And I think as a result of that, we're seeing centres refocus on that experience, on culture, on events, on concerts, um, on activities, not just the large centres, but small centres as well. And I think that's something that I see the future of, of town centres pivoting more and more towards. Um, I think the second thing is that um, you know, my my instinct, um, I don't necessarily have any data on this, but you know, is that the impact of the internet through e-commerce on the physical form um, and the function of the high street hasn't bottomed out yet. We, you know, there's there's probably more to go before that fully manifests in in reshaping property in the high street. And I think you know what that really means in practice is, you know, we are going to see. Um, retail forming a smaller you know, proportion. We're going to see some consolidation. We're going to see an increased polarization, but we are going to see you know, an increase and in proliferation of new types of retail, new formats, you know, with a more emphasis, um, as Don was just picking up there on the sort of the, the brand side of this as well. Um, I think finally, you know, I see you know, repurposing being a massive opportunity. I see there being a boom for repurposing, not just because of the scale of space for which there will be opportunity for new uses and new activities to come into town centres but also I think because there'll be a drive towards repurposing both from a private funding perspective and from a public sector incentivization perspective you know particularly reflecting you know the sort of you know embodied carbon agenda and the importance of a sort of re repurposing over over new builds so so i think yeah. you know that's a massive opportunity for how how, how town centers will re reshape as well yeah that's great and that's a really interesting point around the sustainability angle for repurposing as well uh morgan may i come to you next please yeah certainly um morgan garfield co-founder at alandi so at alandi we focus very much on town centers and have always come at it from a from a retail perspective and I think we actually sit at a crossroads and it's really important to to realize that not everything that's happening in retail is necessarily bad or broken at the moment post covid we've actually seen a, a pretty positive rebound in in shopping behavior um that said there are long term trends that were set in pre covid were probably exacerbated during lockdown that I think we now have to have to realize so that is the polarization that Stephen mentioned destination shopping centers the better ones have largely now repopulated the empty Debenhams and the you know got over the loss of the Arcadia brands and are starting to reinvent themselves as as places that people want to attend footfall is still by and large lower than it was in 2019 but interestingly our figures show that spend is up and actually people are more purposeful when they go to those places. Um, you've seen that in retail parks and you've seen it in, in local convenience where footfall is generally higher and people have reconnected with, with shopping locally. However, you've still got that vacancy. And you know, as, as the numbers that Dominic showed you, that vacancy is somewhere between 10 and 20 percent on pretty much every high street in the UK. There is too many. There are too many shops in the UK. Fact. You, know, you can dispute how much too much but you know there has to be a change in the the land uses within our town centers but that's also a wonderful opportunity how many towns do you go to where you know the architecture is dominated by 1960s 1970s your know, arndale style shopping centers that are no longer fit for purpose and this is a great generational opportunity i believe to bring a true mix of uses back into the town center and one of the things we as a property community um, need to, to be able to communicate is why a town centre is important. 
they're not just a piece of real estate infrastructure that are there for rental value and IRR returns. They're almost the 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 personification, the you know, the built representation of what a community has to offer. And if they are vibrant, healthy places, they've got a whole series of social value connotations. You know, crime reduces, employment increases, prospects improve, health improves, education improves. Um, and we collectively, including government, have to look at that opportunity. And you know, Dominic makes the point that the cash is cash is constrained. I think that's a universal pattern. But we have to invest in in the infrastructure if we're serious about leveling up in the UK. This has to be something that public sector, private sector comes together and really tries to um, make the most of our town centres. And I think that's a huge opportunity. It's a challenge for sure, but an opportunity that that we can lean into at this point. Yeah, thanks. And, I, and again, I think it's interesting in terms of um, perceived viability as well, because often um, it, uh, landlords can fill their shopping centres. So for the average, you know, um, the, the the local community, a centre in some cases might actually look full uh, or, you know, it might even be 80, 90 percent let. But of course, the rents aren't there to support it. And, and often when you look five years back at what that town centre was at that point to where it is now and you and you future forecast, there is a definite downtrend. And it feels like now is the time to nip it in the bud and to be able to add all these additive uses uh, and different layers of why uh, the community might engage with that town centre, which will help support that microeconomy. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, Lucy, may I come to you next, please? Hi, everybody. Um, good to be here. My name is Lucy Wilkins. I'm Deputy Director of Urban Policy in the Department for uh, Leveling Up Community and Housing. Um, thanks for sharing the report. Um, in terms of the future of, of high streets and town centres, I, I'm, I'm not going to, I think, sort of rehash a lot of what Dominic and others had, had said on, on the trends. Um, I think there is a lot of consensus about what, what the that future vision should be about that sort of mixed use, vibrant, experience based um, destination. And I really agree with with Morgan's points about how vital high streets and town centres are in terms of sort of, you know, the arteries, the beating heart of a community and how important they are to, to pride in place and the leveling up um, uh, agenda. And, you know, these areas should be sort of uh, mini uh, hubs of, of, of local local growth. I think I'm, uh, sort of, you know, interested in, in how actually this sort of vision, this experience based vision and mixed use is going to be um, achieved obviously the challenges and the opportunities vary wildly depending on on those local economies and as Dominic talked about that the challenge of those so-called tertiary towns and locations are, are, are sort of the most intractable I think and the really difficult ones to tackle I think if I if I had to kind of boil it down in terms of you know what are we going to do uh, to to get there I think it is about sort of the key principles of of diversification of that mixed use element and then also the kind of uh, leadership through through local partnership and uh, very much part of that I mean that sort of the business community and, and business and investors um, government is doing a range of initiatives um, to encourage some of that you know we obviously have things such as business improvement districts um, but I think there, there is more that we should be doing we've, we've got the town deal structure which is about local leaders and, and expert and, and business experts coming in an advisory function we've got the high street task force and um, we're also it's a small initiative but we're, we're piloting these uh, these high street accelerators we announced 2.5 million funding to pilot up to 10 um, more details in due course but the kind of principle principles behind this of creating a partnership that is made up of the local authority, business owners, the local community and property owners to come together and work out how can they stimulate private sector investment, how can they um, identify what is the, the vision for the transformation and the change in that high street or town centre that is needed, I think is hopefully quite exciting and uh, we want it to be a sort of a grassroots uh, movement. Um, so I think that to me is a, a sort of an area of sort of of, of change and, and a key trend that I'd like to explore further. Yeah, and um, particularly for Bruntwood and, and other developers uh, like ourselves, the um, the joint venture partnerships that we create with local authorities, where we're both invested clearly for the long term as opposed to the short term, enables 
um, you know, change over time. These things won't be fixed quickly. Um, so that, you know, that's great also. And, and uh, we were part of the Stratford uh, of the, uh, in greater, sorry, in Trafford, I should say, uh, part of the pilot for the community interest, interest district. And that's been, um, you know, that's been a really interesting process as well, where very much community led um, decision making uh, for, you know, by the community for the community. Uh, and uh, I'm just just checking the uh, Q&A and I can't actually see any questions uh, in the Q&A function. So it's just at the bottom, a uh, little um, emblem saying q and If you could just pop uh, something in there, that would be amazing. Thank you. I do have some uh, questions of my own, so we won't be stuck for anything to say, but I would very much like to hear your thoughts and comments and questions, please. Um, and last but not least, uh, Tom, please. Hello everyone, uh, Tom, I lead the site acquisition at Souk, who uh, are a pop-up operator. Um, again, to Lucy's point, I don't want to repeat too much of what was said there. Um, I'm, I'm in agreement with it all, but what I think touches on Dominic's points um, as part of the review now, since the introduction of the phone, if you can buy anything from anywhere, there is a choice point of why you would visit a town centre. So... I think what, from my perspective, I, I anticipate to see a lot more um, and again was spoken about is what are retailers and what are we going to produce as part of this repurposing that are going to give people that, those additional choices or the feeling of if I don't go there today, it won't be the same tomorrow. So um, event based um, introducing kind of healthcare into into centres, um, services um, and, and everything that's around that that creates this placemaking um, that means people are going to be visiting locations where there are retail more often, therefore support the overall ecosystem of, of a town centre. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and we, we've, we've talked in the past, haven't we, about how uh, bringing Souk onto the high street can really drive footfall uh, and interest into that location um, and help drive entrepreneurial um startup businesses as well so it's uh, it's a great thing to have on the high street um i am pleased to say that we're we've got a number of questions now uh coming through on the uh function uh the first one is from uh, lydia merry uh, from schroders uh and she asks who is the best who is best to fund this regeneration investors need financial returns public sector pensions only want to support the local town but to achieve returns, attract wider change, you need to scale. It must be valuable for investors too to make projects happen. Maybe I could come to Stephen, and I'm sure uh, Morgan has a view on this also. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think, well, my answer will be that it's got to be a combination of both. Uh, you know, kind of, I think as you, you allude to it in the question there, um, you know, the private investors, the institutions, you know, they want steady and safe returns and I think you know in order to achieve that we need a successful kind of occupier market based town centre we don't always have that and I think that's where the public sector can come in um, the public sector obviously needs to get a return and as I think Don was saying earlier we saw what what's happened with Birmingham yesterday you know we can't rely on the local authorities to, to step in to that space but I think that there is a, a case for a kind of a, a public sector form of long-term patient funding, you know, that is prepared to, to get in, you know, at the outset to help get to a position of stability, help create that occupier sector, which can then facilitate and kind of enable kind of the, the, the funds to come in after that. And I think it's kind of how, you know, how that can be structured and how that can be facilitated, you know, particularly given the pressures on local authorities. Morgan, would you like to add to that? Um, yeah, this is one of my one of my soapbox topics. Really, is how, <laughs> we haven't how, got that long, Morgan. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll give you short. How how do how do we create? You know, the real estate industry is really about capital distribution, and it, you know we're cap probably the most capital intensive industry in the world. How do we create the right form of capital for these projects? And if you look at our sector, by and large, it breaks into short term risk capital. You know, the private equity, real estate, you know, private investors who are willing to invest a pound a day to make two pounds tomorrow and take quite a lot of risk with it. And then you've got the long-term institutional capital that typically wants safe, secure, long-term income returns, but doesn't want a lot of risk. You know, these regeneration projects are high risk and long-term. 
you know, our industry is not very well kitted up to 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 address that. I think it's positive that you've seen some of the UK institutions start to talk about social capital. So you know, Schroders have just launched their own fund. Um, but you know, Aviva, MNG, LNG as of this world, starting to look at that. And I think accessing our our local authority pension funds to reinvest in the regions has to, has to be a positive pattern that should be encouraged. But you still end up with a viability issue. Um, and you know, to regenerate the town centre is far more expensive than to build housing on a green field. Um, Doug makes the point in another question on, uh, I can say about you know, if we just go simply resi in these town centres, that, that's not sus long term sustainable. And I totally agree. And there are a number of local authorities who are petrified of the concept of all of their buildings becoming very low value um, social housing, which you know, create, creates its own issues around amenity and, and, and infrastructure. But we, we, I think we have to accept that there is these are difficult projects. Viability is challenging. Viability is more challenging the weaker the local economy. So you know, the areas that need the most regeneration are probably the hardest to regenerate. And in those areas, you probably need local authority and central government to come together to create the environment and the infrastructure. I agree with Stephen, it can't be fully financed. But if they can create the environment, the infrastructure, as Homes England have tried to do in the, the home space and are now starting to look at regeneration, how can a local authority bring forward development without funding it themselves? You, they bring their own uses into it, bring schools, bring local authority offices, bring libraries back into the town centre. That's something that has an intrinsic value that a developer or an owner can, can rentalise and then facilitates the investment in, in the rest of the amenity that has to go around it that might not be as economically viable but is as critical in in the mix so it's it's got to be a, it's got to be a combination of things and unfortunately albeit you look, government can have lots of pats on the back for small scale short-term projects there is not a long-term reliable credible deliverable central government pot of capital that funds regeneration um and you know, for, if, if we don't address that leveling up just isn't going to happen Lisa, can I just, can Sorry, I just yeah. come in on that, Andrea, yeah, and, and add yeah. to this point? I uh, you know, completely agree with everything it said, and that's actually what we envisaged in in our initial uh, sort of, um, push for town centre investment zones. They are, we intend them to be, we'd like them to be, or high street accelerators as they've been rebranded, long term, and be that space where the local authority can corral the other stakeholders, particularly landowners, into a place where they will understand that there is a shared vision and a long-term plan for the regeneration of that area on the understanding that the local authority is probably these days best placed as the facilitator, the the the, the bringing together of everybody, the, the corralla, if you like, uh, of the different players, but not necessarily the funder. It, but it has very important powers of planning, of um, assembly and of um, association and convening. So if you can use those powers, align those with the capital uh, that's potentially at play from private sector investors, then you've actually got something that could work in the long term. And actually, I think, actually, you know, could mitigate or overcome some of the short term, uh, the problems with the short term projects that we've seen, short term funds we've seen in, in recent years. And just to, to come in, I'd, I'd add there's, there's probably something the government we could be doing more actively. We're, we're doing it in places, but about making sure that we utilise all of all of governments uh, and the amenities that that we hold um, in terms of repurposing town centres. So, what more can we be doing about you know creating job centres or community diagnostic centres and using our footprint and our relationship with the NHS to do that? And that is certainly something that we are really interested in doing because again, that brings the obvious point, but brings in the footfall uh, as as well as a potentially repurposing of buildings. Yeah, great. That, excellent, thank you. And and Tom, um, I just wondered how you view the almost the vibrancy of the high street at the moment, and to what extent do town centre property owners understand what the modern consumers want? You know, and are their leasing approaches a problem? Yeah, uh, it's a tough one to answer about the vibrancy. I think it depends what high street you're on. Um, there's been obviously winners and losers off the off the back of COVID, and 
found it really interesting the BBC report that came out kind of damning Oxford Street but it was outside Foot Asylum's new flagship opposite Reserve's new flagship by Pandora's new flagship and then you've got PSG only the next block um, so I I think the picture is being painted um, slightly worse than it is generally um, but to, to the point then on um, kind of the landlords understanding brands today and the way I normally talk about this is how it's changed from businesses opening in physical first to opening digitally first. And the mindset that comes with that, with um, kind of being a digital business, you have agility built into what you do from day one. You have flexibility to change to your consumers' needs and demands um, day by day. And you can understand and learn from that. And actually taking kind of the last two months as an example and you know where we saw kind of how poorly retail had performed due to the weather actually online businesses there can adapt to that they can change what they're pushing towards their customers they can discount quickly and effectively um, and and basically adapt and and keep performing to a certain degree when the external environment changes now when we look at that in terms of landlords engaging with these businesses they expect that same level of agility and you know that 10 year and now probably more five year lease just just doesn't work for them they need to be more agile um but that's not to say things aren't happening already so i mean grosvenor released a short form lease we work on kind of short form licenses and and there is a lot being done from landlords in terms of kind of innovation but not shiny innovation i'd call it um on how they engage and you know, i think dominic's fourth um recommendation around legislation and simplifying things that you know, makes it a bit less scary for businesses who have been used to dictate how they work who are now engaging in a in a physical world where things have been done a certain way for so long that they just don't really understand nor want to pay a lawyer you know the best part of fifteen thousand pounds to understand so um I think we're moving in the right direction there. Um, I think there's, you know, COVID has forced collaboration, and I think that's a great thing from um, from the landlord tenant relationship. But there's there's still a long way to go um, in that regard. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, and Stephen, what um, if we talk to, to the sort of the barriers, I guess, and the opportunities for new entrants in retail hospitality? Um, and perhaps leisure players uh, in town centres and high streets. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think well, it's it's. We've a broad... touched on one, sorry, didn't we? In terms of maybe yeah. the, the lease structure, but are there any others? Yeah, I mean, it's a kind of broad question. I mean, to pick to just pick, uh, you know, one one barrier, one one opportunity. I think you know, from a barrier perspective, I think cost, you know, remains a you know probably the most significant barrier for for occupiers in you know in general once they've you know they've made a, a decision they want to be somewhere be that the you know the, the, the costs of, of property acquisition be that the, the sort of rental commitment the, the fit out you know and the rates and if you compare that with you know what what it costs to set up a business online or in a retail park for example you know you can see that there's a there's a, there's a big there's a big distinction so i think you know cost you know rem remains a kind of, a kind of an issue for, for the town center occupier um i think from an opportunity perspective i mean we've talked a bit about you know repurposing and i think i think repurposing does you know offer some significant opportunities and one in particular that i would you know like to pick up on is you know i think i think morgan mentioned that there are too many shops and, and i think the opportunity to to reuse some of those small shops for SME businesses and to to encourage, you know, that sort of SME sector to start coming into to town centres and link into the the kind of growing consumer sort of demand for the sort of provenance of, of sort of local, you know, local retailers etc. is something that, that that could be could be facilitated as well. Yeah, and I guess that goes on to the point that Doug's making that, you know, um, we talk about uh, repurposing for, for re retail and offices to residential space. And obviously you're not talking about that. You're talking about new retail and uh, operators into the market. Yeah. Um, so maybe, I don't, Morgan, you've just picked up on it before in terms of residential space. But, you know, do do you think that if we repurpose these retail sites to residents, it is going you know, it's unlikely that we, well, we won't get them back and, and therefore is that going to be an issue going forward? Um, 
I don't I really don't think we need to worry about not having enough retail space in this country. I think the, the likelihood that we need more retail space than we've got the, today is, is is slim. But I don't think you should see residential as a panacea that fixes all all ills. Um, you know, it has been a hot space, but you know, what is the right residential mix to bring into a community? And that answer is going to be very different in you know, an urban you know, an urban environment in Manchester and London compared to you know a, a suburban environment, and it's going to be influenced by the available housing stock. And we've got to look at these things bottom up. I think not just assume that one solution is the is the right solution. And you know, we spend a lot of time in the towns where we operate talking to stakeholders, studying the data, studying you know, the technology, you know, using the technology to study how yeah. people behave and where they, you know, to, to find out what the optimal mix is. Um, and you know, it's going to be different in different places. And that's I, I you know, that's actually one of the challenges here. If if it was just a matter of building the same block everywhere around the UK, people could get on and do it. But yeah, you know, mm. if we need scale solutions because the challenge is is quite universal, but we need local solutions at the same time. And that that doesn't make doesn't make the the job any easier, unfortunately. No, but I think we're in an, we're in a more interesting space than we ever have been in terms of using technology and data to actually make decisions uh, that are backed up with the evidence, and that gives um, you know investors and uh, and local authorities and indeed communities the the um, the confidence um, of the of, long, of the longevity of the of the project and the future proofing of the town centre. Um, I'm just conscious of time. Um, so before we wrap up, I wondered if there were any final thoughts uh, from the panellists. Um, may I start with uh, Lucy, please? Um, so I think I think my, my the, the main my main point is that, you know, as everyone has been saying, funding is constrained and in many ways, we want to move off uh, the long term panaceas to move off a model where, um, you know, town centres and high streets are dependent on, on big government capital um, chunks of, of funding. Um, so really, I think very much in the market for what more we can be doing to encourage private sector investment and also uh, philanthropic investment and interest um, to rege regenerate our, our towns. I think I very much take the point in the report about the ad hoc nature of government funding um, and and sort of the short term um, nature of it. You know, we are we are trying, we are doing a sort of a funding simplification program within government to address some of this. There's a devolution agenda, which I think is really quite exciting in terms of where we are in some of these large areas. Um, and there are always sort of political constraints about how long term we can go. Um, but uh, very much uh, these are issues that are up for, that are being debated and fully recognised in terms of um, of how we can support town centre regeneration. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, Morgan, please. Um, sorry, Lucy, I'm going to be a bit controversial about that. The um, I agree that we can't expect central government to finance everything. However, when people talk about high streets being a priority, they evidently aren't. Um, and I know that isn't for the lack of hard work from you and your colleagues and your team. But, you know, when a government initiative is financed with two and a half million quid, you know, we spend two and a half million quid refurbishing in single shop. Um, it's, you know, it's insignificant. The business rates fundamental reform was not a fundamental reform. It was a tinkering around the edges. You know, we've got one of the most heavily taxed real estate industries in, of any developed nation. And that it doesn't matter that that tax falls on landlords or tenants. It's it's an invisible golden egg for Treasury. I appreciate that. But these these are taxes on entrepreneurship, on growth, on desperately trying to encourage a, a ground up economic recovery in this country. And if you can't give away a shop because an entrepreneur can't afford the business rates, um, you, and that is most acute in the in the most rundown areas of the country, you're fighting against the system, unfortunately. And you, I think you, local authorities have to come together, private capital has to come together to try and make these things work because it is for, for societal benefit. It's not just a, an economic return. And 
collectively drag central government along because you know the initiative central government are running at the minute are are sort of um lightweight to say the least great thank you um stephen please yeah just very very quickly you know i suppose my final thought would be you know that in, in terms of you know in the future we we need to kind of embrace embrace the the kind of forces that have, have changed and you know from what i have seen in many of the you know the, the government policy activity um you know it's been sometimes knee-jerk and wanting to sort of preserve go back to to what there was and and i think you know morgan makes a good point that you know the scale of the changes you know they're impacting um you know really necessitate us to kind of embrace that and look at what the opportunities are and, and obviously that takes you to to that repurposing agenda and i would like to see you know a big focus on you know what we can do in in that regard before i come on to Dom, uh, tom and uh, dominic um i'm not sure if any of the panelists could just uh, pop back into the um question and answers section there are a couple of questions that we didn't get to and they're quite interesting and you, and you may actually just want to give your view on on the um on the function if that's okay uh, in the meantime uh, tom uh, please could you give us your roundup yeah i think um again not not too dissimilar to what's been said i think the focus on diversification to build resilience within town centres for me is is very key. Um, just to, I know Blackpool was cited as an example, but legal in general in Eastbourne, um, developing kind of a co-working space with a marketplace within the shopping centre so people can actually access and then build through the system. So, you know, you can set your business up there. It's very kind of... Um, through the whole journey of a business effectively supporting them. So how kind of talking about supporting entrepreneurs and so on. And then, you know, that that choice point that I mentioned earlier, what what are we doing to create that? That means that people will make a choice to visit a town centre um, to, to, you know, to ultimately spend their money there. Okay, thank you. And Dominic, please. Thanks. Um, I mean, I, I think really the answer to a lot of these uh, locations and, and improving or regenerating town centres is about public private partnership. It's about the private sector bringing capacity, investment expertise, the public sector bringing a long term approach, planning powers, convening powers and working together. Uh, and it's worth noting that actually some of that is more easily done when you have regional or bigger than local governance where you have uh, genuine fiscal devolution. So um, the ability to raise taxes or to borrow on the strength of assets and then to generate uh, a return on that investment. And that is that sort of long term patient investment that we've we've seen. And actually, just to Ed's uh, question, who asks whether the bid funding model is right, I don't think it's necessarily the case that the bid funding model is wrong. I just don't think bids are necessarily um, yeah, they do what they do, and in some cases well, some cases perhaps less well. But I think they are not the the um, the mechanism by which we achieve big regeneration, and that has to be at a much larger scale than we currently really have in most places, in certainly in England. Great, thank you very much. And conscious, we've got one minute left, so uh, just a quick reminder that the. Uh, webinar has been recorded and will be available online in a few days time hopefully Friday uh, so please feel free to watch again and share with your colleagues um, and if you head to the BPF website you'll find further information on the report uh, and many other uh, things on there as well uh, including a list of upcoming events uh, so very much wanted to say thank you to all of our speakers uh, to Stephen, Morgan, Lucy and Tom and our keynote speaker Dominic thank you very much uh, and very much uh, wanted to say a big thank you for all attending. Uh, and last but not least, I hope you'll be able to join us very again soon uh, in the near future. Thank you very much. <laughs>